Uh, rather than go through and introduce each person one at a time, if you're watching this video, their name will flash across the screen. So at this time, I present to you, I don't like the way I said that. So with that, we will now have our first message given to us by Apostle Victoria Ramirez. And these will go until the concluding message, which will be shared with us by Matriarch Annie Rose. I greet you today in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, the living Jesus Christ, as we stand at the gate of the Messianic Age. We have chosen as the theme for our gathering, Being Zion. This is my favorite topic, Zion. I want to begin my message today with a, two scriptures that define my view of Zion. The first one is listed in the Joseph Smith translation as well as the inspired version, Genesis 9, 22 and 23. For this is mine everlasting covenant when thy posterity shall embrace the truth and look upward. Then Zion shall look downward, and all the heavens shall shake with gladness, and the earth shall tremble with joy, and the general assembly of the church of the firstborn shall come down out of heaven and possess the earth, and shall have place until the end come. This is mine everlasting covenant which I made with thy father Enoch. There is another scripture that I can't leave out when I am describing what this is trying to share with us about the everlasting covenant. Behold, it is my will that they who call on my name and worship me according to my everlasting gospel. Gather together and stand in holy places and prepare for the revolution, revelation which is to come when the veil of the covering of my temple in my tabernacle, which hideth the earth, shall be taken off, and all flesh shall see me together. This is from the RLDS, Doctrine and Covenants, 98, section, verse 5a. The special part that must take place within any group who what really wants to move up in their journey spiritually and how we can overcome our differences of opinion and our perspectives. We have the opportunity to challenge each other as well as ourselves over and over, and we have had this opportunity throughout this last year, and it will continue as we go forward. As we have done so, we have found there are levels that we have moved through as we have studied the book we chose for our of our gathering as fellowship Community Building, A Different Drum by Scott Peck. It is very apparent that this concept I mentioned regarding chaos is the part of this process that each group who truly chooses to come to a spirit of unity must pass through. And it will not only be once we will reach certain levels as we go forward and will come to another point of chaos where we have to go back and reassess where we are and whether we want to proceed together or not. We have had several opportunities to experience that as a group as well. We are now finding ourselves standing on the threshold of a new level of development as a unity movement of love. This becomes a cohesive force which has formed a force field that surrounds us as we come together in our weekly meetings. I believe we have only just begun this journey. One highlight we have experienced together in this last year during our time was an invitation to join the Messianic Council with Enoch, where we were being challenged to contemplate what this really means and what it is that we are being called to do by this experience. We are now standing at the door being invited to experience together a new level of development in our progress towards being Zion. 
We extend this invitation to all. Come and see. Come and experience with us. For Zion it cannot be defined, as there is no definition. Zion is a verb. Come and experience Zion together with us. Today I close this message with the words of a very special hymn that was given to the RLDS Church and sung at a church reunion by Joseph Love through the power of inspiration in the early 1900s. Some of you may know this hymn, some of you may not. But to me, they define the experience of what God is calling us today and has been calling us since the restoration was brought about on the earth 200 years ago. O oh, my people, saith the Spirit, hear the word of God today. Be not slothful, but obedient. Tis the world's momentous day. Unto honor I have called you, honor great as angels know. Heed ye then a father's counsel, and by deeds your purpose show. Time is ripe, my work must hasten. Whoso will by my the, may bide the hour. Not can harm whom God protecteth. Elements confess his power. Up ye then to the high places, I have bid you occupy. Peril waits upon the heedless, but grace upon the souls who try. Love ye me, and love all people. Love as I have loved you. This your calling, this is my purpose. Thus be my disciples true. Then, in this exalted station, your companion... I will be, for every promise of my scriptures will be verified in thee. Get ye up then to your mountain, Zion of this closing day, for the glory of my coming waits to break upon your way. Forth from thence your testimony shall to trembling nations go, and the world confess that with you God has residence below. May the Lord bless this message today and add his edification to the word that has been delivered. In the name of Jesus Christ, I offer this. Amen. Brothers and sisters, immediately before the millennium begins, the wicked who remain after the tribulation will have their final opportunity to be converted or destroyed by fire, much like the Lamanites as recorded in Helaman 5. There will be no wicked left on the earth for Satan to tempt, and Satan will be bound for a thousand years while peace reigns over the earth. At the end of the millennium of peace, the wicked will be resurrected, and once again Satan will have power on the earth for a short time. The clear connection between Satan's power and the wicked on the earth is not a coincidence. Nephi, the son of Lehi, prophesied regarding Satan being bound in the millennium by explaining that he will be bound by the righteousness of the people, saying, quote, And because of the righteousness of the people, Satan has no power. Wherefore, he cannot be loosed for the space of many years, for he hath no power over the hearts of the people, for they dwell in righteousness, and the Holy One of Israel reigneth. The Lord reiterated this to the modern church, saying, And Satan shall be bound, that he shall have no place in the hearts of the children of men. We see an example of such a society recorded in 4th Nephi immediately following the destruction of the more wicked, and the extended visit of Jesus Christ. Nephi, the son of Nephi, summarizes this period as paradise by saying, quote, And it came to pass that in the thirty-sixth year the people were all converted unto the Lord upon all the face of the land, both Nephites and Lamanites, and there were no contentions and disputations among them. And every man did deal justly one with another, and they had all things common among them. Therefore there were no rich and poor, bond and free, but they were all made free and partakers of the heavenly gift. And it came to pass that there was no contention in the land because of the love of God which did dwell in the hearts of the people. And there were no envyings, nor strifes, nor tumults, nor whoredoms, nor lying, nor murders, no, nor any manner of lasciviousness. And surely there could not be a happier people among all the people who had been created by the hand of God. There were no robbers, nor murderers, neither were there Lamanites or any manner of ites, but they were all one, the children of Christ and heirs to the kingdom of God. And how blessed were they! For the Lord did bless them in all their doings. Yea, even they were blessed and prospered until a hundred and ten years had passed away, and the first generation of Christ had passed away, and there were no contention in all the land. 
Nephi continues his summary, telling us that this beautiful life continued and Satan was bound by their righteousness so that he had no power over them for about 90 years. He explains how all this ended when the people began to give Satan place in their hearts. Quote, and now, in this two hundred and first year, there began to be among them those who were lifted up in pride, such as the wearing of costly apparel, and all manner of fine pearls and of the fine things of the world. And from that time forth they did have their goods and their substance, substances no more in common among them. And they began to be divided into classes. They began to build up their churches unto themselves to get gain, and began to deny the true church of Christ. And because of the power of Satan, who did get hold upon their hearts... Among the teachings of Christ, we find the information and instruction necessary to not only bind Satan in our own lives, but also in our community and society. This information is the seed of Zion and the first of the principles of peace, which are required to maintain peace in any society. Zion is the result of living all the principles of peace together. Zion cannot exist unless Satan is bound by the righteousness of the people who live there. To bind Satan, we must first understand where he gains his power to rule and reign with blood and horror on the earth. When we understand how we give him his power, it becomes easy to understand how to take his power away. When he has no power, he is bound by our righteousness. In the endowment ceremony, we find an exchange between Elohim and Satan, in which we learn where Satan gains his power. Elohim says, I will place enmity between thee, speaking to Satan, and the seed of the woman. Thou mayest have power to bruise his heel, but he shall have power to crush thy head. To this, Lucifer responds, Then with that enmity, I will take up the treasures of the earth, and with gold and silver, I will buy armies and navies, popes and priests, to reign with blood and horror on the earth. Remember that this is the first thing Nephi told us regarding the people's fall from peace, was that their pride led them to wearing of costly apparel, and all manner of fine pearls, and of the fine things of the world, which quickly led them to not having their goods and substance in common, and ultimately resulted in the people being divided into social classes. A few years down that path, and they begin to see the war, bloodshed, horror that Satan promised. These are all symptoms of the issue that we see in our societies today. But the cause of these symptoms is the enmity that Satan uses to do all of it. Satan said he would use that enmity placed between him and the seed or posterity of Eve to reign and bring about all these things. Enmity means a feeling or state of hatred or animosity. Satan uses our enmity or hatred for evil to inspire us to do evil. In every war, both sides of the war are convinced that they are doing good and their enemies are evil or bad. This is how Satan uses our enmity for evil to reign with blood and horror on the earth. As long as we continue to harbor enmity for our enemies and the evil they do, Satan will use that enmity to keep us from being Zion. Jesus understood the problem and the solution clearly and taught us how to take away Satan's power and bind him in our lives, saying, quote, Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thy enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same. And if you salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so? Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. End quote. When we love our enemies and do good to them, we refuse to hurt or destroy them. We are no longer pawns for Satan. He no longer has power over us to buy up armies and navies, false priests who oppress and tyrants who destroy and reign with blood and horror on the earth. This is a major and repeated theme throughout Christ's teachings. In one example, Jesus then taught the story of the Good Samaritan. He used a Samaritan as the hero of the story, knowing that they were the enemies of the Jews. The story of the Good Samaritan is an example of how we are to treat our enemies. If we all did this, is there any doubt we would be living in Zion? Love our enemy does not mean we have to agree with them, obey them, or join them. Loving your enemy means that you accept that they are progressing and making mistakes just like you are. You forgive them for their trespasses against you. You serve them just as you do your friends and those you agree with. 
You even protect their right and freedom to be wrong and act according to their own sacred freedom of conscience, as long as they are not infringing on the freedoms of others. When we love our enemies and our neighbor, we share our goods and sustenance with them, so that there are no poor among us. We care for them, and they for us, not trying to elevate ourselves above one another. Learning to love our enemy is worth our lifelong attention and consideration. Jesus gave us two great examples to get us started in this pursuit by pointing out that God, quote, maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and the unjust, end quote. Following these examples, he instructed us, saying, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect, end quote. As long as we maintain enmity for our enemies, we are dangerous to righteousness, and we are under Satan's power. The ultimate solution to this issue is to give up your enmity and learn to love your enemy as yourself. The Lord pointed out that when enmity ceases, Satan will not have power to tempt man anymore. Quote, and in that day, the enmity of man and the enmity of beasts, yea, the enmity of all flesh shall cease from before my face. And in that day whatsoever any man shall ask, I shall give it unto him. And in that day Satan shall not have power to tempt any man. End quote. The only way to bind Satan is to do exactly what Jesus taught, by loving our enemy as much as we love ourselves. All the law and all the prophets hang on these two commandments, love God and love your enemy as yourself. Only by loving our enemy do we become righteous enough to bind Satan so that he has no power over our hearts. I share with you my witness that this is within our power to do, here and now. We must learn to love one another with our differences before Zion can dwell in us. When Zion dwells in us, we will find that we are also dwelling in Zion. I share with you my witness of the reality of Jesus Christ. I've heard his own voice, and I've been held in his loving arms. I stood in his presence with my wife, Rebecca, and we've been instructed by him directly. The message of this talk is one that we received from him and share with his blessing. I leave this message with you and encourage you to love your enemy as you love yourself. In the name of my friend and mentor, Jesus Christ, amen. My message is based on Luke 10, 42. But one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen the better part, which shall not be taken away from her. What was taken away, and why? It is not entirely clear from the text, apart from Mary Magdalene's desire to avoid helping her sister Martha around the house, in exchange for sitting at Jesus' feet. But it was not merely housework she was shying away from. So what exactly was it? Why would she want to sit at Jesus' feet and listen to what he had to say? I'm convinced there's a message here for all of us. And we are all here because we, like Mary, have chosen that better part. From the time of King Josiah's reforms, our connection to the mother goddess in heaven has been lost. 2 Kings 23, 3-6 through six, recounts this story. Verse 3, And the king stood by a pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and statutes with all their heart, all their soul, to perform the words of this covenant that were written in this book. And all the people stood to the covenant. Verse 4, And the king commanded Hilkiah the high priest, and the priest of the second order, and the priest of the door, the keepers of the door, to bring forth out of the temple of the Lord all the vessels that were made for Baal, and for the grove, and for the host of heaven. And he burned them without Jerusalem in the fields of Kidron, and carried the ashes of them unto Bethel. Verse 5, And he put down the idolatrous priest, whom the kings of Judah had ordained to burn incense in the high places of the cities of Judah, and in the places round about Jerusalem, them also that burned incense unto Baal, to the sun, and to the moon, and to the planets, and to all of the host of heaven. Verse 6, And he brought out the grove from the house of the Lord, without Jerusalem, unto the brook of Kidron, 
and burned it at the Brook Kidron and stamped it in small to powder and cast the powder thereof upon the graves of the children of the people. It should be noted that the grove is a reference to the sacred shrines for Heavenly Mother. The host of heaven was dismissed along with her. There is evidence to suggest that during the time of the prophets, the ancient Israelites kept these lost traditions alive, despite the prophets' efforts to condemn the continuation of these practices. The book of Jeremiah in 1718 notes how the men and children would gather firewood to light the fire, while the women would bake bread in honor of the Queen of Heaven. They would also pour out libations or liquid offerings in her honor, as they did in the temple courtyard during the time of jubilant celebration. Isaiah 50 verse 1, compared with 2 Nephi 7 1, recounts the following. Where is the bill of your mother's divorcement, whom I have put away? Behold, for your iniquities have ye sold yourselves, and for your transgressions is your mother put away. Here Isaiah is recounting the history of what happened, and that is exactly what it is, history. Far too much time has passed, and Heavenly Mother's time is reemerging in our day. Just as our first ancestors were given a choice in the garden, the first sacred grove, we too are given a choice. And the question we must ask ourselves is, will we choose the better part? Shalom, brothers and sisters. I have been asked to speak to you today about Zion, and I've been asked to be brief. So God willing, I shall do both. I speak to you as saints of the Most High God. Whether you're in this fellowship or that fellowship, whether you're in this local church or that local church, in any of the stakes of that one universal church of Christ, of which there is a central place. And you know as saints what the scriptures record about Zion. Going back to the time of Enoch, when he ruled as king of kings in that city of peace, and you know what it says recorded, that they were of one heart and one mind and dwelt in righteousness, and there was no poor among them. And because they perfected living that principle of Zion in the flesh, they were taken up. And I speak to you today from Independence, Missouri, that place designated by Joseph Smith as the center place of Zion. But truly, today that center place is in that heavenly Zion, because it is not to be found upon the earth. And it is not lacking because of the promises which God Almighty has given us are lacking. God has not failed to do his part, but we, the saints, of God, the recipients of his bounteous gifts and mercies, have failed to fulfill on those promises. Oh, we have tried many times. Whether it was ancestors of ours among the saints in Utah, or in Independence, or in Vori, or anywhere else that it was tried. It lasted for a time, and it is no more. Many of those in those traditions, in those branches of our church, have given up on following the commandments to gather to Zion. They've given up on following the commandment to observe the law of consecration. And they've said that these things are too hard. That it is against our nature and that we will not be able to observe them and obey them until 
something else happens in our world until Christ comes to set the church in order, until he brings about a fundamental change in human behavior. Many say that it is not possible to live these laws because they go against human nature. To be loving, to be kind, to be generous, to be forgiving, to be merciful and understanding, and to look on each other with grace, long-suffering, to not be broken apart by hurt feelings, by gossip, by injustices, by perceived inequalities, because some contribute more than others. Are these things against our human nature? Of course they are. Of course they are, and our Heavenly Father has told us as such. For he has said that the natural human being is an enemy to God and has been ever since that fall of Adam, or the fall of mankind. And so we, being in a fallen state, living with human passions and human challenges and temptations of the flesh, yes, it is impossible. The Apostle has told us that it is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Indeed, the Lord has told us to be perfect, even as I or your Father in heaven are perfect. Is it possible to be perfect? Most would say no, and I say no. Mankind cannot, by his or her will alone, become perfect. But with God, are all things possible. Indeed, God has given us every grace and blessing, the very presence of his Holy Spirit to dwell inside us, to wrought a mighty change of heart. God has given us the gift of his very presence inside us to bring about a mighty change of heart a spiritual transformation to help us to overcome every temptation, every infirmity of body and mind to perfect us so that we can live the laws. For those who excuse themselves in not living these commandments, these laws, what do you say when people say that the law of tithing is too hard? Indeed, the law of tithing is extremely difficult for everyone who cannot pay their bills, yet there are always the widows who put in their mites. What of those people who say the law of chastity is too hard, that it goes against nature, that they burn in the flesh with intense passions and desires that they cannot overcome? God says that is true. You cannot without God. You do not excuse these people from living the law of chastity. So why do you excuse yourselves from living the law of consecration? Why do you excuse yourselves for not gathering to Zion? Why do you excuse yourselves in not accepting that gift of transformation by the Spirit to become the perfect human beings that can fully realize these laws and fully realize the kingdom of heaven on earth. Now there are millions of saints throughout the world and many times more who are called by our Heavenly Father to become saints. And they cannot all gather to one place on earth. But you can gather to Zion in your hearts. Some of you can gather physically. 
Some of you can gather into local stakes or branches of one Zion by transforming your hearts in that Holy Spirit, transforming your minds to thinking different thoughts, holy thoughts, godly thoughts. With his help, we can do this. We can become that people that he has foreordained us to be. That we can gather first in our hearts. And that we can gather into communities wherever we are. Indeed, to live in a state of Zion within your heart first and in a constant way of being that invites others to be in community with you. And to make sure that those stakes have saints in them that are inviting their brother, brethren and sisters to live those principles with them. Many of you wait for local leaders to give you a command to do these things. But since when has God told us to wait for human beings to say it is okay to live the principles that he has already given us by commandment in his law. Indeed, the Lord says that we should be anxiously engaged in a good cause, bring to pass many acts of righteousness, and that we should not wait to be commanded specifically in all things, but indeed, we have already been commanded in these things. So brothers and sisters, again, we are human beings, and we suffer the inflictions present in this natural world. But we have faith that we have a very real divine being who is not of this world, but who will come into our hearts and dwell with us here and transform us from the inside out, making us new creatures and with this promise, all things are possible. Therefore, Zion is possible. Consecration is possible. And indeed, until we give place for Christ to come in our hearts, he can never come to rule over us in any other way. I leave this with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, well, uh, thank you for letting me be here today. <clears throat> One of the things I would like us to do is I would like you all to visualize yourself standing before the face of the divine. Picture yourself bathed in the most glorious light your mind can imagine. Imagine your body becoming a bioreceiver, a biotransducer. And as this superscript flows through you, you offer up your voice to dedicate yourself to the higher service of love and light to this world and to the future worlds to come. Can you hear the glorious shouts of Hosanna? Now the definition of a script is that of the original or the principal instrument. A script appears non-linear, non-static, non-changing, and yet it imprints, thus producing reality. And this is why John the Divine's scroll in Revelations tells us that the scroll was written within and on the reverse side, not simply a series of words, but thought forms, imprinted images, that presented the entire Alpha and Omega, the Aleph Tav creation. <clears throat> and according to Dal Malachi, the nature of this supernal consciousness force is like a fire <clears throat> and that everything it touches transforms and illuminates. This illuminating and transforming 
on every level of consciousness into the likeness and the image of itself, that which created it. So this superscript exists in a multi-dimensional picture that describes beyond the formal expression of the written word or the mundane expression of language. These are flowing flames of consciousness illumination on many levels because man himself exists on many levels. Now the superscript I wanna to talk to you about today is the many and the one. This hypersphere of resonance will always be able to connect themselves to the source through the gates of resonance or the power of the light. And it is imprinting this force that we connect with called the creator. The human family, <clears throat> once it makes this connection, becoming a superscript has the privilege of using this power of light and controlling the light through the love of the living light. <clears throat> it is, its true force is the development of the many being brought back into the one or the body of the Adam Kadmon, the perfect original creature. Now we've been given a trinitized model of male, female, and child of the tetragrammaton, the inevitable name of God <clears throat> through the image of the Christ. This model gathers within its structure, the three plus seven to establish our consciousness time zone. We also have the model of the 10 generations of Adam as a living model for us. And reigning over this supernal model is the superscript of the loving Christ who has collected into itself all the individual ones through the greatest love that's ever been known. As we recognize this coded superscript of those generations, plus the Christ superscript, we begin to recognize the multidimensional, the many layers of this pyramid code that has been placed before us. And we hearken to the words of Thomas, and Mary who were taught by Jesus that, these, that the two, the many, become one, not only one with the creator, but with each other as we love our neighbor as ourselves. So I say to you, arise, O sons and daughters of light, Yahweh, Yedor, Yahweh, Elohim, ever renewing, ever regenerating your divine consciousness which leads to a new being, a greater freedom, and a more perfect union of the divine family. Amen. <clears throat>